Thank you. So um, I would like to thank the organizers for you know, running this, uh, this seminar series. It's, a, it's really great. And um, so I wanted to talk today about some uh, research I did. Uh, this I think I started about a year and a half ago. Um, this really just started with me just playing around with ideas and seeing what I could do. Uh, thinking about the Riemann hypothesis, not really getting any ideas how to solve it, but just kind of messing around. And then just with enough work, this kind of evolved into sort of a result. So um, I just wanted to, to share this with you. So um, I wanted to start my talk with the Riemann zeta function. So everyone here, I'm sure, knows what it is. Okay, and um, so the Riemann zeta function, as you know, is defined by this uh, the series, also as an Euler product, um, has uh, the pole at um, s equal one, no other pole. Uh, we know about the zeros at the negative even integers. Um, the Riemann hypothesis would say that all the remaining zeros um, all lie on the half line inside the critical strip. And of course, the Riemann hypothesis is a statement that um, the zeta of s is non-zero if the real part of s is bigger than one half. Okay, so I started um, I'm thinking about this in terms of uh, ferry fractions, and uh, you know, an old result of Fresnel and Lando um, gives us equivalence of the Riemann hypothesis with a statement about the distribution of ferry fractions. So one thing I learned, I um, don't know why I never saw, learned this before when I was studying ferry series, I learned that um, ferry series are neither series nor were they invented by ferry. Originally, they, they go back to a mathematician called, named Haros in 1802. Um, the ferry series of, um, of any level is a collection of all the fractions whose uh, denominator is bounded by um, a natural number n. And these are all written in a reduced form. So all the fractions from 0 to 1, um, which are reduced and ordered um, from least to largest. And so the Fresnel-Lando theorem says, well, if you take... Um, you know, if you look at the sequence of uh, fractions in a particular ferry um, series like this, and you compare that to um, the number k divided by the cardinality of f of n, you know, both sequences um, start at zero, start around zero and end up at one. So you can compare the difference of them and the absolute value of the difference summed from k equal one to f of n satisfies a bound, which is n to the one half plus epsilon for any given epsilon, this kind of bound um, is uh, equivalent to uh, the Riemann hypothesis. Okay, and if you want a, um, just, uh, you know, the only unconditional bound would have uh, n to the power of one here. Okay, so, we're essentially just um, thinking about how these fractions increase from zero to one compared to something which is increasing in a just a linear fashion uh, from zero to one. Okay, and we can um, we can uh, view the statement about the Riemann hypothesis in terms of local discrepancy. So if we take any real number between zero and one and compare um, alpha to well, the proportion of uh, ferry fractions um, in the interval from zero to alpha with the overall um, number of fractions in that set, you know, we should roughly capture alpha, you know, proportion alpha of the ferry fractions. You would um, intuitively think that this number should be reasonably small. And so then the uh, Fresnel-Landau theorem can be expressed, um, well, it just uh, simply translates into um, the statement. Okay, um, Niederreiter in the 73 studied, you know, the absolute discrepancy, which is the, the maximum of these 
uh, local discrepancies. Um, he showed that um, d sub n as a function of n has an order of uh, growth, which is uh, the cardinality of fn to the minus one half. Um, later, Dress uh, proved this uh, surprising result that the discrepancy, you know, that this uh, absolute discrepancy for given n is equal to um, one over n. And so just to let you know, the cardinality of the Ferry series um, asymptotically is a pro uh, it uh, approaches uh, 3 over pi squared times n squared. So, um, so Niederreiter's uh, result is consistent with this, but this is obviously more precise. Okay. Um, uh, one of the results that Fresnel and Lando established back in 1924, they were also looking at something which essentially relates to these uh, local discrepancies. Um, so they show that if you get a, if you can bound the sum of uh, these discrepancies and get a bound of n to the sigma zero for some sigma zero bigger than a half, well, that's equivalent to um, a bound on the it's on the second moment of these discrepancies, and it's also equivalent to a bound on the summatory function of the Mobius function. So the Mobius function, um, the sum of the Mobius function up to x satisfies a bound x to the sigma zero for a given sigma zero um, bigger than a half. Um, that's equivalent to the statement about the distribution of the Fary fractions. So for this talk, um, you know, I I just uh, wanted to make this this weak version of the Riemann hypothesis. I, I know I'm not the first one, but um, so we'll call this a uh, R H uh, sigma zero is the the hypothesis that the Riemann zeta function has no zeros in the half plane sigma bigger than sigma zero. So maybe we can't prove the full Riemann hypothesis, but you know maybe someday we'll show non-vanishing in a strip to the to the left of the the line real part of s equal one. And so my my uh, paper kind of uh, you know relates to you know this statement about um, a weak form of the Riemann hypothesis. Okay, what I looked at are um, very fractions with square free denominators. So instead of taking the entire ensemble of uh, fairy fractions, just focusing on the ones for which the denominator is a square free number, um, can we say that these are also evenly distributed relative to this uh, weak Riemann hypothesis? Um, can, you know, that is, can we get an analog of the Fresnel Lando result? in this case where the denominators are square free. So um, here's a little terminology. I decided to write phi sub n as this is uh, really the fractions that lie in the Fairy series of level n, which don't lie in the Fairy series of level n minus one. So these are just the fractions which have a denominator equal to n. Okay, so the denominator is equal to n and then uh, we demand that uh, the numerator should be co-prime to n. So the cardinality of the set would just be the Euler function phi of n. Um, and then I look at this ensemble of Fairy fractions where I'm taking um, the Fairy fractions whose denominator is square free, so mu squared of n equals one. This notation um, n tilde n is common I think you've all seen this. So if, well, let me try that again. So n, by an abuse of, uh, of terminology, I'll write sometimes n is equivalent to n. This means that um, little n is bigger than capital N, less than or equal to uh, 2n. So n lying in some dyadic interval that starts at capital N. And this shouldn't cause any problems. I, I know this is like common notation. So um, 
Um, just so we're all on the same page, it's not too hard to get an uh, estimate for the cardinality of the set. And the main thing that um, I wanted to mention is that, you know, this set also grows like n squared times some constant. Okay, so um, now I can show you uh, the theorem that I proved. So first off, if you, uh, let's say that you have sigma zero, which is a, a real number, I'm gonna assume it's less than one. And suppose that the weak Riemann hypothesis holds for that value of sigma zero. So we have a non-vanishing and a strip. Um, in this case, uh, there are numbers, constants C0 and epsilon 0, which have this property that um, if you take any epsilon, um, which is in the interval from 0 to epsilon 0, um, you can get an estimate. So here I'm estimating how many of these Fairy fractions with square free denominators um, hit the interval from 0 to a over q. Okay, a over q is a fraction, I'll explain. So um, if the if these fairy fractions with square free denominator are uniformly distributed, you'd expect to get this proportion of them to hit that set. And um, under the uh, this assumption of the non-vanishing of the Riemann zeta function, um, you actually hit the target. So the the number of Fairy fractions that hit this interval is what you'd expect, plus an error term, which is big O of n to the one minus epsilon. So, um, and that, um, okay, and this works for, for fractions whose, uh, whose denominators are prime numbers, Q, and the, um, this uh, value of Q can go as large as um, the power N to the one minus C zero of epsilon. Okay, so just to say a few things like this, I mean, this cardinality, as I said, grows like N squared. So you're talking, this error term is giving you something that's more than a square root, uh, more than a square root uh, cancellation. Uh, so it's a pretty um, fine distribution. Um, you would expect to get this, of course, just um, for ordinary Fairy series. Um, but this is uh, this result also works if you restrict to the Fairy series that have square free denominators. And uh, probably uh, one of the main points of this theorem is the fact that the um, these uh, denominators Q, these primes can go pretty high, like that you can take them um, almost as large as the the number n itself, and you still get a, a pretty good distribution um, relative to that. Um, then the converse theorem says that, well, if you have two constants which have this property that I just talked about, so the, um, the distribution of Fairy fractions um, for all primes up to here, up to this level, um, that that also implies the Riemann hypothesis um, in, uh, or the non-vanishing in a strip. Okay, so um, so these uh, these results go both ways. Um, is there are there any questions about what this this theorem says? How how important it is that your Endpoint is irrational, A over Q. Well, um, uh, for what I did, it um, like I'll show like the connection between this and like other uh, rational numbers. Um, for at least for the technique that I was using, I tried to remove the uh, denominator, the constraint that these denominators are prime and. You know, there are places where at least my approach to to doing this breaks down. So um, it could it could well be the case. I mean, um, I mean, if you assume if you assume this, and then you get this statement, 
Um, and uh, well, then the converse also holds. I think from this, we can also deduce a statement for um, arbitrary primes, uh, but I'll get to this because, um, yeah, I didn't answer that very well. Let me try this again. So in I sense, think the, the main yeah, problem, yeah. what's in that? Sense, in a sense, your statement is stronger if you have a special uh, fraction here over Q because it's of the equivalence in, in, in the statement. Right. Yeah, I, I think to... that um, part of the pro well, yeah, part of the problem is that um, at least the method I was using breaks down if Q isn't prime for one thing, and also um, there's a problem with the distribution of Fairy fractions when you take a, when you compare what's happening with the with like a denominators which <clears throat> are. Um, if if they're too large, for example, it's, it doesn't work. Um, one over n is too large. You, we can't take q all the way up to n, but there's also seems to be a problem with having small denominators as well. Um, the distributions are a little bit off. So um, it may be that by the end of this talk, I'll have answered your question. Oh, so you expect that distribution would be very different? Huh? Mm -hmm. Yeah, like. Um, I mean, I think you know, like I when you follow what's happening, like numbers. in this uh, in this theorem, right? Like, one of the problems with this theorem is that, like, at the beginning, where you have these reciprocals of integers, um, for a while, um, these discrepancies are kind of large, and it's only later on that, sort of on average, you you get a bound like this, even under the Riemann hypothesis. So the um, like this fraction here tends to to shoot over to one faster than than these ones are shooting over to one. Okay. But eventually everything kind of catches up. Like. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Um. So I was going to show you like the approach. Um. You know how I went about doing this, and I know that. I already know that like there are things in this paper that could have been done better, um, but um, at some point you, I just uh, submitted it. So I may come back to version 2.0, which is like a sharper form of all this stuff. Anyway, the, like the, one of the genesis of this work was just to um, starting with this observation that you can get an expression for the Riemann zeta function by taking a sum over the positive integers n, mu squared n over n to the s times this function uh, p sub s of n. Um, p sub s of n, I define it as the sum or the divisors d dividing n of mu d times d to the minus s. And this works out to um, a product over the primes dividing n, one minus uh, p to the minus s. So this is a, it's almost with a reciprocal here, you'd, you'd have a part, a piece of the Riemann zeta function, um, but sort of a finite piece. And, uh, you know, this uh, equality follows just by looking at the, you know, the Euler product expression for the uh, zeta function, and then taking like these terms and just writing the last, uh, all the terms after the first one is a geometric series. And then you get this, and then um, thinking about what that means in terms of these uh, multiplicative functions. So one thing about the, the zeta function is like the, the square free numbers sort of capture everything that you need to know about the zeta function you know, through like an identity like this, you know, numbers which aren't square free um, play a kind of secondary role, at least from this point of view. Okay, so um, uh, looking at this identity, I started thinking, well, can we can we um, get sim something similar to this by, um, by taking other um, expressions which are, you know, kind of reflect this, uh, didn't say that very well, but I started looking at um, functions which are similar to zeta um, in the sense I'm here, I'm looking at mu squared n divided by n to the s, p s of n. 
And if this function is identically one, this is g of n, then I recover the Riemann zeta function, but I can put other arithmetic functions in there as well. So um, one class of functions, if you, if you have a, a multiplicative function g, and suppose that that satisfies uh, the property that g of a prime power p to the k is just equal to g of p. Um, so these values are all the same for any um, positive k. Well, if you um, if you take such a g and plug it into this expression and unfold the Euler product and compare things, you find that in that case, um, you're just back to an ordinary Dirichlet series with the same function g as the Dirichlet coefficients. Okay, so everything kind of drops out. And this is why, you know, in the case where g is just identically one, um, this condition clearly holds, it's multiplicative. This term vanishes, and then this becomes um, identically one here. So you just recover uh, the Riemann zeta function. Um, you can also use the same trick with, uh, with a principal character. So if, uh, if a chi zero is a principal character modulo any um, q, um, the same trick works. We have um, this expression and we recover uh, the L function for the principal character. However, we get something. Whoa. Um, okay, I heard something um, anyway. Um, so uh, if you're working with a principal character, this is all um, this is all great, um, nothing new. If you plug in a, a non-principal character chi, so we look at this um, mu squared n chi of n over n to the s p p s of n and and fold this. Well, you do pick up the L function of chi associated associated to chi, and then there's this kind of correction factor here. So it's not quite an equality, but um, you can express RS chi in terms of that. Um, you know, this uh, this piece of it is a regular, and um, uh, this piece yeah it has no poles uh, if real part of S is bigger than a half, and so um, this even these functions will continue analytically to the half plane sigma bigger than a half. And they have the same zeros, which is kind of cool. Okay, then I um, I looked at some other functions. So um, here I'm going to uh, use the sawtooth function, and I just define this uh, psi of t is the fractional part of t minus a half if t is a real number which is not an integer and i took this to have the value zero for integers and uh we can consider this as one of these functions uh g of n um now kind of moving away from multiplicative characters um we get like this this new function which is i don't know what to call it i'll just call it the sawtooth so um and I started, um, I looked at this in the paper. So um, this is the, um, what I'll use um, in the case of uh, dealing with these uh, fairy fractions. We take uh, this real number alpha um, to be um, a fraction A over Q, where Q is a prime number. Um, here's some, some notation. So I use Z sub Q as Z mod QZ z sub q cross for the multiplicative group. And we're I wanted to look at um, these kinds of uh, Dirichlet series. Okay, so here's the definition again. Um, one thing, if q divides a, then this this term by periodicity just becomes zero and the way I've defined things, psi of zero is zero. So in that case, you get a function which is identically zero. Um, if, uh, if A is not in the zero 
residue class mod Q, um, you can actually, you can unfold this a little bit um, and show that uh, S A over Q S. Um, I show how to do this in the paper. It's not, not difficult, um, but we get an expression for S A over Q. So that the sawtooth function is minus one over pi I Q uh, times Q minus one. And then we have a sum over the uh, Dirichlet characters mod Q, which are odd. Um, chi of A, so the A is related to this numerator. Um, here's the Gauss sum, L1 chi, and then RS chi, that's the function I looked at before, which is, which looks a lot like, um, this RS chi looks a lot like LS chi times this extra fudge factor. Okay, anyway, since each of these functions continue to the half plane sigma bigger than a half, then we know that the sawtooth also continues to that whole, that half plane. Um, beyond that, um, well, I won't say. Okay, so um, I'll try to show how this function rears its ugly head in all of this, um, in all of this. So first off, if you, um, I'm going to take A over Q as a fraction, I'm going to assume Q is a prime number for now. And then, um, so with this choice of alpha, a straightforward calculation shows that if you look at just the Fairy fractions with denominator equal to N, the number of those that hit this interval from zero to alpha is, is equal to alpha times phi of N, so the expected number, and then there's a correct correction term, R of N, which can be written as a sum over the divisors d of n, mu of d, alpha n over d. And so writing it this way. Um, now, if n is square free, um, you know, we can separate mu of n over d as mu of n times mu of d. Um, and then also uh, this term, the fractional part here is just off by a constant times uh, this term. So using the fact that the sum of the Mobius function mu of d over all divisors d of n is zero, we can kind of introduce an extra minus a half into here and turn this into the sawtooth. So we get this uh, explicit um, formula for the error term in this, in this approximation. Okay, and now if I sum over n, n, uh, you know, in the this uh, dyadic interval, and and the ones which are which satisfy the square free condition, um, now I have a way to estimate uh, the intersection of, or the cardinality of the intersection of s sub n with uh, the interval zero to alpha, and I get um, the expected value here, and now my error term looks like g of n, which is um, this sort of a sum. Okay, so basically just taking this this expression for R of n and summing over um, n in the dyadic interval. And the, the Mobius function here is going to take, is going to uh, select out the integers n, which are square free. Now we reverse the order of summation. We can write g of n, this error term, this way where um, m sub d of n, this is a sum over integers in the dyadic interval from uh, n over d to 2n over d, and but only those which are co-prime to d. And so here's where this, uh, this kind of function starts showing, popping out this uh, p sub s. If we just look at the, the infinite series uh, mu of n over m to the s, uh, but restricted to integers m, which are co-prime to d, um, this series looks like a one over zeta of s times this uh, correction factor p sub s of d. And so if we use a Perron's formula, we can get an um, approximate value for this m of d. So we can we can approximate this term, which is a piece of the this error term. 
And so we get m sub d of n um, looks like this plus an error term. And um, there's uh, we have flexibility for the, the uh, number t. I think I, well, I, you know, we just have to optimize at the end. The t I'll assume is smaller than capital N, but otherwise I won't say too much about it. So um, I think also technically when I did this, uh, the proof I had to assume that capital N was irrational just so that things kind of work out in a nice simple way, but um, that's not really like a, an important assumption. Okay, so anyway, we can we can approximate m of d, which shows up in this expression for g of n, with this integral, and then a an error term which isn't too bad. Okay, and so now we want to kind of sum. We want to multiply by this factor, and then sum uh, over d up to n. So multiply by uh, mu squared d times uh, psi of alpha d. We sum. Now we have an, ex an integral expression for g of n, the error term. And applying the sum, we have a, well, this term here multiplied by um, a partial sum of the sawtooth. And then we have an, an error term which is acceptable for us. So um, this piece here is just a partial sum of the sawtooth function, the sawtooth series that I um, showed you about. Okay, and then um, what I did to try to to deal with this uh, function g of n was to say, well, um, uh, can we take this partial sum and expand it to the full series? I know that the full series is analytic all the way to us, uh, um, sigma equals a half. And so, you know, if I can replace this by the full series, I mean, I mean, this partial series is also also like that. So that's not the only reason, but um, anyway, the idea is to try to shift the, the line of integration into the critical strip. And if we know that we're avoiding zeros, so if the, the weak Riemann hypothesis is true, we can avoid zeros of the zeta function. We can shift everything over and get a strong uh, estimate for the error term. Okay, and so that's that's sort of how the the proof of this uh, forward in, implication of the theorem goes. So um, just to kind of recap, you know, I've this uh, quantity here, which I'm trying to estimate in the theorem. You know, I've expressed everything in terms of this function g of n, and g of n is given by this integral plus an acceptable error, and I just need to show that the integral um, satisfies this. Um, taking, you know, well, it's sort of taking an appropriate choice of t. Okay, um, what I needed, what needs to happen though for this to work is we need a kind of a good bound on this uh, function and i used a a generalization of a blomer's theorem to get a strong bound on both uh, the the absolute value of the sawtooth and then also the difference between you know the full series and the partial series so we put um these bounds, uh, getting strong bounds on these quantities allows me to just replace this function by the completed uh, sawtooth series. Um, and I, I thought that um, this is like just a, a reasonable way to proceed. It, it, you know, it makes it kind of clear how things work. It also, this also opens up the door to, you know, getting explicit formulas. So maybe you have zeros of the zeta function you know, close to one, but you can still um, express this error in terms of the zeros. And um, if you do that, so um, I don't even think I did that in my paper, but one of the things, um, if you, so if you've replaced this expression by the full sawtooth function, and then you shift past zeros of the zeta function, you're going to get an expression for this error term in terms of zeros of zeta. Um, but 
what the expression gives you is like a series. Or let me just go back here. Yeah, you know, we end up getting something like this showing up where we're taking zeros of the Riemann zeta function, but we're evaluating the L functions of uh, non trivial Dirichlet characters on the zeros of the zeta function. And this is the term that shows up um, when you do that. Um, I don't know. You guys can tell me if you've ever seen like examples where you have like a series involving, you know, Dir non trivial uh, Dirichlet characters evaluated at zeros of the zeta function. But anyway, that's what shows up. Um, maybe I just haven't um, seen it. Yeah, that's possible too. Okay. Um, so before I um, you know, finish this explanation, let me just tell you a little bit about this, uh, the theorem of Blomer that, um, which is really like the main workhorse of all of this. Um, so, okay, so um, the theorem of Blomer that I used in this paper was, um, was a theorem where he was considering square free numbers in arithmetic progressions. Um, so you compare, the the number of uh, square free integers in a given arithmetic progression to the expected number of them and then uh, this is like a it's like a second moment over all all possible um, congruence classes of the of this error term and he he showed that this uh, this second moment expression is bounded by something like um, x to the epsilon times x plus uh, the minimum x to the 5 thirds q to the minus 1 uh, q squared. OK, um, so this was like the starting point um, for me. And what I did was to generalize this. So instead of just um, summing mu squared n, I was trying to do this with more arbitrary function. So let's just say that we have uh, some multiplicative function little f, and then associated to this function little f, I'm going to define a new function capital F, which is the sum d divides n mu of d f of d. Okay, so little f gives rise to capital F. And so then um, Blomer's theorem here, I wanted to replace mu squared of n by mu squared times this function capital F of n. Now, if you take as your given multiplicative function, you just take the characteristic function of the of the integer one, right? That's the identity in the, the ring of Dirichlet series. Then uh, the ring of, uh, uh, well, in the ring of uh, arithmetic functions uh, with respect to Dirichlet convolution. So anyway, if you take little f to be just the, the indicator function of the number one, then that gives you capital F is the function which is identically one. And so then um, this expression just becomes mu squared. So like this generalization um, with functions like this in includes uh, Blomer's result is a, a special case. And for this um, to work, I needed to make some assumptions. Now, I know some of this like uh, may strike you as a little odd, but um, the result I gave basically for theta and the window from 2 thirds to 4 thirds, I assume that my function little f satisfies a bound of this form, m to the minus theta e to the um, omega of m and this uh, this should work for all uh, for all positive integers m a little omega is the number of uh, distinct prime factors of m um, i define uh, just to be able to state the result cleanly or cleaner i define x sub theta to be x to the one minus theta plus one zq is the product over the primes other than q. Um, 
Let's see. Now there, here's a, a little typo here. I this uh, because uh, um, the theorem I'm stating here actually works for all um, integers, whether or not they're prime. So so this this should actually read p doesn't divide q. Okay, in both places. Okay, um, this particular theorem does you, we don't need q to be a prime number for this to work. Anyway, I have this uh, z sub q is this expression, which is defined in terms of uh, our function f. And then zeta q of 2 is like just a piece of um, zeta. And I think I'm missing a minus, I'm missing minus 1 here, looks like. OK, and so here's, um, here's the theory. Theorem. So I'm taking this function mu n times capital F of n, and looking at um, you know, looking at a sum like this over a given arithmetic progression. Then I compare compare the value of that sum to its expected value, and again it's a sort of a second moment type bound as we run over all the congruence classes mod q. Um, And uh, and then you know this bound maybe it's hard to see what's happening but I think if you if you take the special case where little f is the um, indicator function of the number one then uh, this this recovers uh, Blomer's result in that case and I think the main thing that's going on here is that if as long as this theta is in this range, you get something uh, which is non-trivial. So, you know, this uh, four thirds is, is only artificial in the sense that, you know, theta can be larger than four thirds, but you don't, um, you know, it, um, this, this approach doesn't give you anything um, non-trivial in that case. Um, the bottom line is that if you're, summing uh, this kind of a function in an arithmetic progression, it's kind of on average pretty close to its expected value. So there's a good distribution in terms of uh, like the integers, you know, this, this kind of a function isn't going to preferentially um, select one congruence class over another one. Okay, for my application, I took um, little f to be this function, mu n over n to the s, p s of n. And you can work out the capital F of n in this case works out to the reciprocal of p s of n. So then, um, you know, this function is pretty simple. And, you know, both of these functions are pretty simple. You can easily satisfy a bound of this type. So, you know, depending on uh, the location of S, you know, there's a an S here in this definition. So depending on uh, its real part, you can apply the theorem with theta equal to the real part of S, and then you see that this bound holds, and so the result of the theorem holds. And so as a corollary, if sigma is between two thirds and four thirds, um, we can bound this. This is the partial sum of the sawtooth I showed you before. And we can see that the this partial sum is bounded by um, this expression. So we get x to the one, one half, q to the one half, um, and then some other stuff here. Well, the... Um, you know, if q is just slightly smaller than x, if it's like x to the 1 minus epsilon, then you get a full savings of a power of x in this estimate. And the other terms also will give you a full savings of a power of x as well. So the this partial sum is, uh, it's a small, it's um, a very small.
Um, anyway, this is uh, this is uh, basically how we how we get this. So, um, all right, I. Um, I'll, in the last couple of slides, I wanted to just show you how the opposite, um, how's the opposite uh, direction go. So for this, uh, for this direction, we assume that there's some constants C0 and epsilon 0 um, for which this nice distribution happens uh, for all primes up to this bound. Okay, and so for the reverse implication, I had this uh, intermediate result, and this is one. Um, this is where like exponential sums come into play, and uh, just like looking at um, distributions. Uh, um, so again, a phi sub n is a set of uh, Fairy fractions with denominator equal to n. My set S sub n is the same as before. It's the Fairy fractions with a uh, Square free denominators with n, you know, in a dyadic interval. Um, I also defined a fairy of capital N to be all of the fairy fractions up to capital N. And I have this kind of technical theorem, which, uh, well, what it says is that if you have a real number alpha from zero to one, and it's not too close to a rational a fairy fraction whose denominator is pretty small so in other words like l over n is lying lies in this set that means that its denominator n is no more than a uh, basically an epsilon power of capital n and so as long as you're not too close to fractions like this you're not in some sort of a window like that then um then we get a, like a nice distribution. The number of fairy fractions with square free denominators in the interval from zero to alpha is the expected value plus, um, plus an error term, which is uh, small enough for the theorem. Okay, um, so then, um, yeah, and th this one, the proof of this is uh, pretty technical. So um, I use exponential sums and and so forth. But um, basically, building on the fact that you know these uh, these kinds of fractions a over q are reasonably well distributed. If we if we're assuming you know this condition to begin with, there's enough of a good distribution of these fractions that we can we can um, we can approximate alpha by one of these fractions a over q. So um, essentially, replace the the idea is to try to replace alpha here by one of these special fractions a over q, where the denominator is a prime, and then use what we know from the from the other theorem from our hypothesis. And you can do that as long as you're not too close to one of these. Uh, fairy fractions with a small denominator. Um, so then we we take uh, the sum the sum over mu of n. Just looking at this sum where we have n uh, in the dyadic interval, uh, we know that the Mobius function mu of n is equal to the sum over all the all the uh, fairy fractions with denominator equal to n, e of x, this is e to the 2 pi i x, as usual. So it's like this uh, sum of uh, cyclotomic, uh, cyclotomic units. And then we can express this sum as a sum over the set S sub capital N of just e, e of x. Um, now I define e of u to be the difference between Sn intersect uh, z the interval 0 to u and then the expected value u times the cardinality of S sub n. And using a partial summation, you can then, you can then convert um, this sum 
here into um, an integral. It's a minus 2 pi i. The integral 0 to 1, yeah, e of u, that's the exponential function, then this error term, du. And then I sort of did like a kind of circle method type argument where you you split the interval from 0 to 1 into major and minor arcs. Now, I know this is not really how it's done like in for for other, those types of applications, but I call here um, M, capital M is the union of these intervals I L over N. This is from my previous theorem. It's the it's the real numbers that lie really close to one of these fairy fractions with a small denominator. So we have those are the major ones, and the minor ones are everything else. And uh, so anyway, if we're away from one of these bad intervals, I can use that previous theorem to get a good bound on this this piece. And then uh, for this other piece, well, we just use the fact that it's small. So I use a kind of a, a stupid bound on E of U. I don't have like a really sharp bound on this, but I can put in something pretty dumb. And that's enough because uh, the the measure of the set a capital M is small enough. Okay, and so this is how. Um, well, at the end of the day, we get a really sharp bound on uh, the sum, and it's actually with a power savings. If um, because uh, we're getting a power savings in this term, and so that's how we produce. That's how you can produce a, a zero-free strip for the Riemann zeta function. All right, so that's it.